Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening to everyone in Singapore and good morning to everyone in Zurich. Um, so welcome to the FCL Global Seminar Series. Um, this is for the Zoom. <laughs> so uh, today we're having a presentation on city knowledge, city's knowledge graph, uh, bridging human and artificial intelligence to support synthesis in city planning by Dr. Peter Hertogs, senior researcher and investigator in FCL Global. Um, just a few house rules before I hand it over to you. Um, so everyone who's online, please uh, post your questions on the chat box. And we have a mic for everyone in the audience to uh, talk to you later. Okay, here. Thank you, Ayanna. Oh, okay. So I hope this works. I have no feedback. <laughs> Okay, uh, welcome everyone here and uh, online. I'm Dr. Peter Hirtogs. Um, I am a senior researcher and investigator uh, in FCL Global. My main research interests are design evaluation and knowledge representation. Um, and I apply that to three main areas, digital um, planning processes, building adaptation and circular economy in construction and public space quality. And um, I'm the co-investigator and project leader of the Cities Knowledge Graph project. I'm also a co-investigator in the Circular Future Cities in the Semantic Urban Elements modules. Okay, mic change. So, let's carry on. Many of us will... Um, deal with city planning in some circumstance. And an interesting aspect of city planning is that it's a process that works towards synthesis with planners uh, creating coherent consensus between targets. So planners try to balance different requirements and find a vision or a design or a plan that works towards a certain future. So in that sense, the synthesis process sets the solution space for our future cities. But the city planning processes need to integrate ever more data, tools, and targets from different domains and departments. Um, where we have more and more urban problems to face, we have more and more urban research to integrate, analyses to comply with, et cetera. And so in that sense, this synthesis process is getting difficult. Cities Knowledge Graph as a project aims to digitally support this uh, synthesis between different domain data. And our approach aims to bridge human and artificial intelligence by formally representing knowledge. And it's this formal knowledge representation that is the essential part. So let's think about these two topics and bridging between human and artificial intelligence. So, Human intelligence works as expected because we're very used to it, uh, but it struggles with scaling and consistent uh, repetition. So if we want to urbanize quickly as we're doing or do it more sustainably, um, that's gonna run into problems if we do it in our conventional way. Artificial intelligence works fast, but it struggles with the implicit and the unknown. It runs on existing data. So here the uh, example image is suggested ice cream flavors from a deep learning algorithm. Clearly, that algorithm misses some kind of uh, tacit knowledge and conceptual pattern recognition that we as human beings have. As human beings, when we're doing our planning practice or other practices, we understand a lot of what's going on and we recognize a lot of patterns implicitly. This means that we struggle with learning things quickly. On the other hand, it, from an artificial intelligence uh, perspective, they, it, the process really relies on explicit knowledge and data. And it also struggles with learning, but it does it very quickly. So these approaches are highly complementary. It's not a narrative of one versus the other or one replacing the other. It's a narrative of blending towards a world where um, quantitative and qualitative applications are linked in a digital planning setting. So the question is, what's a knowledge graph and how does this relate to this question? So all of us use knowledge graph technology on a daily basis and knowledge graph technology uh, brings together 
multi-domain data in a meaningful way. Um, it runs in the back end of several large uh, tech things, Google being one of them. So it specializes in the synthesis of data. So if you get these kind of uh, synthesized info sheets in Google, those are what Google calls its knowledge graph parts. But if you're using any kind of assistant, it's also synthesizing concepts and meanings in order to provide you with an answer. And so it's these kinds of applications that knowledge graphs are used for. And knowledge graphs represent more than just data. That's the difference. Uh, they represent the meanings and relationships between the data. And so a knowledge graph is an advanced form of an ontology and an ontology central to knowledge representation. You can consider an ontology as a common language to help understand the knowledge in a certain domain. So you don't just have data points, for example, a database of American presidents. Uh, you have instances of presidents and extra information, for example, a relation to a certain first lazy that also has an instance. And in that way, uh, an ontology formally defines the relationships between all the contexts in the knowledge domain. This is a generic example, but you can apply this to planning and make an ontology of land use regulations, for example, and more on that later. So in Cities Knowledge Graph, uh, we're trying to bridge the gap between the many knowledge domains that planning has to integrate and their, their tools and their data, and that's something that's uh, proliferating, and use cases in planning. And so we do this by representing knowledge domains as ontologies, structuring data using those ontologies, having agents to automate certain data processing and evaluation steps, having an interface that planners can use in use cases. And Knowledge Graph technology has three main advantages supporting synthesis in planning. The first is interoperability and incremental scaling. So what you're developing is a shared and incremental knowledge representation and data interpretation where newly integrated data and its interpretations, its semantics are added to what you've already done. And so in that way, you're building up to a wonderful collection. The second benefit is that it becomes easy to integrate and automate tools. So you can automate certain aspects of data gathering and planning uh, and integrate tools and evaluation so that you can uh, automatically run part of them in order to answer certain questions. And thirdly, you can explore, create, and learn using a knowledge graph. Uh, for example, doing parallel simulations um, for alternative planning scenarios or doing reasoning and inference on planning knowledge because you have a representation of knowledge so you can start reasoning with it or by augmenting how this graph works by the agents that operate in the graph. These three points are also a kind of level of technology. So the first one is much easier to implement than the last one, and that's the kind of levels of technology uh, that we're following. There's more than this, but these three, you should see them as scales like this. So Cities Knowledge Graph is a three year or three and a half year uh, intercreate project that uh, combines computer science and urban research. This is our team. Um, it's a collaboration of Cambridge Cares and the Singapore ETH Center. Um, and our PIs are Professor Marcus Kraft and Professor Martin Rabo. And if I want you to remember something is that the central idea of our work is that uh, we can support synthesis by doing formal knowledge representation. Um, and in that sense, the, the, the idea of representing knowledge is a general thing and you apply it to a specific domain or topic. So in that sense, city planning like we're doing is just a particular domain. It's one that, you know, clicks with a lot of other work, but it's just one application. And there's a couple of things that I would like to highlight or prime you with before I go into uh, some examples. And that is that the first is that knowledge representation is useful both for machines because they don't know what data means and so you add this meeting meaning explicitly it's also useful for humans because humans are not good at making explicit representations of their knowledge they rely a lot on our implicit understanding of things and so that exercise is beneficial 
And it's also beneficial for interoperability and synthesis because having explicit representations of what we mean with concept helps us to understand the difference between our meanings and helps us to communicate and work together. And when we're talking about synthesis, this implies three things. The first thing is interoperability. That's kind of the, the general aim. We want seamless exchanges between tools and data and knowledge and domains. Of course, that's difficult to achieve, but that's, that's the goal, this seamlessness. But there's also incrementality because of course we can't represent all knowledge in one go. So we have to have things in place to be able to evolve incrementally. That means using standards, uh, upgrading as you go, uh, blending different research efforts together, etc. The third point is diversity. And that is um, because if you want to synthesize and solve a complex problem where people have a lot of different viewpoints, or you might have different results, different representations of things at different granularities of level, level of detail, you need a system that can represent all of these and check which one is better in which circumstance or which uh, interpretation might lead to one effect or another. And in that sense, diversity is, uh, is something important to um, support. And so, like I mentioned already, knowledge representation as an endeavor is more a paradigm. Uh, so there's many levels of technology, but the technology itself is domain agnostic. It doesn't matter what you apply it to, but of course the application and the domain knowledge that you're working with is specific. So in our case, that would be city planning. So in, in the seminar, I'll give you an overview of our project in two parts. First, I'll highlight some background and key concepts, and then I'll showcase the benefits of knowledge graph technology for city planning, which is the aim of our project. And I'll do that based on three demos, but our project's not finished yet, so our demos aren't finished yet either. So there will be more about demo one than about demo three in that sense, but this is what we're building towards. And I'll end with conclusions. So first, some background, and then firstly about ontologies, semantic web technologies, and knowledge graphs. So ontologies are the core active artifacts of knowledge representation. A very famous definition is that an ontology is an explicit, explicit specification of a conceptualization. If that sounds abstract and philosophic, that's because it is. Um, there's other definitions, but we're talking about how to conceptualize things and represent them. So you're conceptualizing the concepts themselves, their relationships, their hierarchies. Um, a little bit of terminology when we're talking about semantic, that semantic, that means relating to meaning in language or logic. An ontology is one representational artifact, so one map of meaning, as it were. Ontology with a capital letter is Aristotelian metaphysics, so the theory of what exists, so the philosophical branch of ontology. Um, and then specifically here, we're talking about applied ontology or computational ontology, and that's the application of these uh, approaches to specific knowledge, knowledge domains using specific computer technology. This is a semantic triple. That's the basic unit of knowledge representation. And you see here A, B, C, subject, predicate, object. So it's two things in a relationship, semantic relationship between them. You see two vertexes and an edge or two nodes and a link. We're talking about relationship representation. So we're talking about graphs, hence knowledge graphs. And we're talking about networks or the web. So semantic network and semantic web. And of course, this is the kind of mathematical representation. You can apply that to a certain field. Now, the semantic web of linked data aims to add meaning to the World Wide Web. It's a concept from the early 2000s. Um, it's attributed to Tim Berners-Lee, uh, who is also one of the originators of the World Wide Web itself. And he says that the semantic web is not a separate web, but an extension of the current one in which information is given well-defined meaning, better enabling computers and people to work in cooperation. So here again, we have this bridge between computers and people. And the main aim is to go from a, or was to go from a web of documents to a web of data, because this move has already, is in the, is in the works or has largely happened. 
initially a web page was simply a document that was hyperlinked to and you did not know what was in the document or a computer did not know. And so by adding semantics, a computer can read the document itself and add additional links of meaning uh, to these documents, creating more web, as it were. And so that enables machines to search and interpret the web to act as functional agents, which is basically assistance. So the whole idea of having assistance stems uh, from, from this concept. Of course, representing knowledge is not something one or even a room full of people will do. It's a kind of human endeavor. Um, so there's a lot of highlights on linked data and linked open data specifically um, to relate data in such a way that machines can browse the web, but also the emphasis on open to do it in a shared and collective way uh, to create a shared knowledge representation. So here's a diagram of the linked open data cloud. It's all kinds of domains and topics, ontologies linked to that data sets within that that are all linked. And in order to do that, you need technologies. And so there's a whole semantic web stack of types of technologies that you can use, hence different levels of technologies, different applications. Um, and so the semantic web is a collaborative movement and its, its standards are governed by the World Wide Web Consortium. So there's standards, how you do things, how you can make things shareable, incremental, etc. And of course, we use this in Cities Knowledge Graph. Knowledge graphs itself refer to large living and learning graph databases. So the term knowledge graph has been around for a long time, but it was popularized by Google in 2012 um, with these kinds of search summaries while you're Googling. And so they denote large scale ontologies where you have many more data points, instances, than you have concepts. Um, and a dynamic knowledge graph as a specific subtype is a type that can reconfigure itself. So it, it can change its graph structure, its ontology as it learns, as it's being queried, et cetera. Now, so knowledge graphs and semantic web technology were in the discipline of AI, uh, specifically the field of knowledge representation and reasoning. And so when we were talking about reasoning and inference, it implies that an AI can draw conclusions based on statements in ontologies, because those statements are codified in some form of formal logic. And so when you're Googling and you string a bunch of queries together, just a random example, who is the father of the wife of the king of Bhutan? The only reason you get something in return is because all those terms are actually semantically represented. And so the machine understands what you mean with this question and can string all those queries together. That implies that your ontologies, it's important that your ontologies are correct. To stick with the strange ice creams, if I define a pizza as a thing with a topping, then a machine will infer that an ice cream is a pizza and might give it a weird name. Of course, uh, any AI topic comes with hype. And so knowledge graphs is at the top of the hype cycle here. Uh, so we're about uh, ready to dive down into the trough of disillusionment. It also explains why a project like this is exploring applications, is looking into you know, the, the horizons, et cetera. Okay. Then a little bit of background on how this relates to planning and particularly synthesis in planning. I'm referring to a literature review that we published. Um, and in this literature review, we defined the, or coined the term semantic city planning systems because our project is in the, the overlap of semantic web technology and city planning. But both are vaguely defined umbrella terms. And so it's quite difficult to pinpoint what is it now exactly. And also, and in order to do that, we defined for meta practices or planning actions that you do while planning. It's actually something you do during the, any form of design, but it could be that research only focuses on representation or projection or evaluation and not necessarily mention even the word city planning. So representation is simply representing things. Usually that's visual in nature, 3D models and these kinds of things. It could be knowledge, but then it becomes synthesis as well. Evaluation is, of course, putting a number uh, on something, evaluating it versus something else. Projection or creation is creating things that don't exist yet and seeing how then you can see how they perform. 
Synthesis is knowledge management. So the act of managing, gathering, using, creating, and synthesizing data information and knowledge about the urban systems you're planning with. These actions happen throughout, they're intermixed, but certain applications could have certain focus points in that sense. And of course, we need to see how our project can support these actions. So for part two of the seminar, I'll showcase some of the benefits of knowledge graphs, or at least some examples of what we're doing. Um, and we're working towards three demonstrators uh, that demonstrate different aspects of this combination of actions. So representation and synthesis, evaluation and synthesis, and projection and synthesis. Um, most of the work has been done on one, two will build on one, three will build on two, etc. cetera. Um, so let's have a look. The first demo is about representation and search, uh, and it's called the programmatic plot finder. So what we did is we made we developed a measurable representation of an intended future city, and that is Singapore and its land use planning regulations. Because as I mentioned, um, what we can do in the city is governed by rules. It's in a sense, a solution space. There's lots of options, but it's nevertheless governed by this. So the master plan is updated every five years and has a 10 to 15 year horizon for planning. For those uh, who don't have a planning background, my favorite way of summarizing planning is that it deals with the question, how much of what goes where and why? That's what you're trying to solve. So it's a resource allocation process. Um, and so, as I mentioned, land use planning regulations will give you the rough boundaries, the solution space of, of your future city, at least what you can build and develop. So if we represent this, what we're doing is we're creating a measurable representation of what our future cities come, uh, could become. It, it, you know, there's, it's a spectrum in a way. Um, understanding how much of what we can build where, which is what we're trying to search for, can then help us adapt and plan for better futures. It gives us a better understanding of the solution space that's governed by regulations. So in this uh, demo, which is work in progress, this is a sneak preview. We're searching for what can go where, and we're finding all plots that allow a combination of programs. So for example, uh, our colleagues at Future Health Technologies are looking for plots that allow a combination of flats and nursing homes, because that's some kind of concept they would like to implement more, and they want to see how frequently can you actually uh, govern, uh, do this. And so this actually gives you the plots where such combinations are allowed, which is something that you currently cannot do. Currently, what you would have to do is look at all the plots, see what zoning type they have, look at the documentation, what kind of uses can be combined in that zoning type in order to then yeah, do it for each plot that you see here and more. This is just the Singapore River area to have a zoom in. But we can do this uh, for the island. And you can, of course, do it for any combination of program uh, that you'd like to see. So what's happening in this demonstrator? Because that's, that's just the tool in a way. That's the search uh, that you can do. Um, I mapped it based on the diagram of our project. So you have a certain search query. You input that in a geospatial web platform. That's what you're seeing. That information gets passed to what we call our city information agent. That retrieves the information from our knowledge graph, which is a uh, running 3D CTDB using a Blaze graph, and it sends it back up. And so, in that sense, that's how the query goes in. The information goes up. That information needs to be put into that knowledge graph. So, we have an import agent, and that uses an ontology of the city GML standard for uh, 3D city models and plot data or master plan data from data.gov.sg in order to put it in our knowledge graph. And there's an export agent that puts it onto the uh, web platform. So for the details, I refer to papers we have on these uh, topics. In that sense, we have a, a way to represent CTGML models. 
And we also have a way to automatically import, update, and visualize these models. And usually when you're dealing with big models, keeping these updated is a difficulty. And now this process has been uh, automated. And we're dealing with large data sets. We're cities knowledge graph, so we have a couple of cities in our knowledge graph. So uh, Berlin, a Berlin building data set has 500,000 buildings, three and a half million city objects, nine and a half million surfaces geometries, and almost half a billion semantic triples. So when you start adding semantic meaning, you're adding a lot of data. So you're getting very big models and you need the infrastructure to run these. Same for Singapore. What you saw is a land plot data set that has uh, 113,000 plots. And a plot is a simple thing. It's just a 2D shape. So it's the same amount of city object, the same amount of geometries, but it has 11 and a half million semantic triples. That's not the only thing that was happening because we actually did the query and that was processed. So we have an ontology called ontozoning, which is an ontology of the the land use regulatory system. And what we did is going from land use planning regulation documents to an ontology for zoning, land use, and program. Here you see an example of a written statement. You get written statements with the master plan here. That's basically PDF documents with information about what you can do. Uh, that, that's the regulations. And so what we did is turn that into an ontology. Here's just an excerpt of that. You have zones, you have uh, uses, programs, you have basically allowance relationship between them. You have quantums, uh, you have sources because we also have integrated data from Google Maps or data from another ontology, etc. And so you get an ontology of these types, what is allowed, how, which are the specific instances, how, how do they relate to each other? And basically, all that regulatory information is then mapped over Singapore because each plot has a certain type and so allows certain things. And so you get a spatial representation of this regulatory information. And sorry for the low resolution of this image. You can do more than the queries currently showed in the demonstrator because you could, uh, for example, check, well, which plots allow residential development are adjacent to a park and have unbuilt gross floor area left. So you could build in other domains and other checks in order to find particular sites. So in, in the example of the uh, nursing home and the flats, you could also check is it, you know, it needs to be this close to a hospital and, and close to a park or something like that in order to fine tune your queries for a certain research or planning uh, purpose. Now let's see an example of looking into how much of what can go where, because of course it's a resource allocation in terms of quantity as well. Um, and for that, what we did is we automated estimates for gross floor area that certain plots allow. And so this is a search for people who like books, beer and big, uh, because we're looking for 50,000 square meters of bar and 50,000 square meters of bookstore. I don't think that will ever, ever be economically feasible, but you can search for it. And so you see the bar solutions first, but if you add another 50,000 square meters, there's only a couple of plots that can support that. And so in that sense, you know, any combination with GFAs you can search for in order to find what, how much of what can you put where. And that's of course a central plan, uh, planning question. So we needed to add a bit more to this system in order to be able to do that, which is an ontology for buildable space. And that governs what you can build potentially. Um, and an agent that can generate these estimates. Um, this is still work in progress. Currently, we only have the Singapore River area uh, that we've covered. And it generates a data set of buildable spaces in GFAs. So we're going from Again, more regulations that we've categorized here um, in terms of different regulations that govern things like building heights, uh, site coverage, land use, setbacks, mapped how, how they affect build volume, because we're estimating only to LOD1 level. And then you need an ontology to cover all these terms and uh, how they actually work as a regulation. So this ontology is the buildable space ontology that we're developing that maps all 
all these uh, concepts and also even concepts that don't explicitly exist because you need, for example, a footprint at each level because the regulations can change. And so that means you need different footprints in instances. You also have lots of exceptions. So you have multiple buildable spaces per plot, depending on the use, depending on the exceptions, etc. So it's quite uh, a complex thing to represent. Now it might be good to um, take a step back and think, well, what, what's, the, what's the benefit or the difference of a knowledge graph approach? Because if we can generate this data and just run it in a normal GIS program, so what are we, why are we making it difficult for ourselves? Um, in that sense, the main difference between a conventional approach to a planning application or another application and a knowledge graph approach is again, this shared knowledge representation. So in a normal approach, different teams or departments or agencies will be making their own tools. And so they'll draw on data. They'll all do their application specific and, and group specific data semantics. So they interpret what all the data points mean and they make the application. And that could be data sets from mobility, urban form, land use, et cetera. In a knowledge graph approach, you're putting a lot of emphasis on creating general data semantics. So you create a common understanding of all these concepts um, through ontologies so that you create linked data sets of these raw domain data. And in our case, we have agents that help with queries that can automate certain aspects. And basically you get a shared uh, knowledge that you can query and make specific applications onto. And so that's the difference. That is interesting, but it's also a lot of work. So that's the downside of, of the method. It, you need to do it in a very consistent, standardized way. Um, it's, for example, making ontologies is not straightforward. It's quite a philosophical endeavor. So in the presented examples, a couple of benefits is, for example, automating the importing, updating, and visualizing of these large models, linking all data semant semantics so that we can do cross-domain queries. So whatever you add in, you can add in your previous applications and your next applications because everything's linked. Uh, producing these data semantics in a standardized way because it's all following certain standards and the ability to represent complex regulatory realities. For example, the exceptions that you have in planning regulations. These wouldn't be straightforward at all to uh, do in a normal relational database. There's of course other things you could be doing, such as now that you have an ontology of reg regulations, you can change it and see what happens. So you, it becomes easier to update regulations without breaking the automations and the calculations that depend on it. And you can also compare, and in master planning setting, that's important, you could compare T, T minus five. So, because it's a five-year process, you can compare the different master plan versions, see how it evolves, et cetera. So it, you, you can understand differences in, in policy uh, better. Okay, so the second demonstrator which as a demonstrator, we haven't started developing yet, but we'll build on the first one. It's called the suitable sites selector. Um, and that goes into evaluation. And what we're basically doing is automating site SWOT analysis. So SWOT is strength, weakness, opportunity, and threat. And it's a common way to basically categorize certain properties of a site and compare different sites. Um, so here, we apply the SWOT analysis uh, to four sites in Singapore, although we could do the whole island. Uh, and we're looking for a SWOT analysis for on-site solar energy potential. The topic doesn't matter that much in the sense that this is a topic we could cover with the data that we had at the point. Um, so it's things like site coverage, plot elongation, shading factors, etc., that give you information about how good is a site for uh, solar energy production. And we made a system that rank that scores these different criteria and ranks them in an opportunity, strength, weaknesses, and threat system, and then maps it into a, a single color so that you can visualize it. But of course, you can see the different um, scores of the different plots within uh, your system. Oh, too fast. So you can compare different districts. You can see how they're doing on this certain topic. Of course, in our demonstrator, we'll look into 
other topics, not necessarily solar potential. The difficulty here is finding a, a formal way to define what, what are the goals, how are they mapped onto these categories. Right now, this is an exploratory way. It's a kind of manual exploration so that we understand the problem better. But to do it formally and automatically, uh, that is the challenge here. And the novelty, because so this is, of course, something that, that can be quite interesting when you're trying to look for a site, when you're trying to recommend a site. Because the previous example search might give you 20 options. Well, what, what's next? What, what with those 20 options? Or a government has 60,000 empty sites. Which ones are best for affordable housing or something like that? We're also integrating uh, software tools that evaluate certain things. So we're automating city energy analysts, or at least cert uh, certain of its um, of its simulations, in order to tell more about uh, the energy potential um, of buildings, or that can be built on plots, in order to, or in order to bring that domain into this fault analysis. And we've also worked on uh, integrating and querying uh, Matsim outputs. So not automating the whole process, but simply taking the output file of such a simulation and then uh, querying it differently and in ways that are more related to land use planning. Because it's, of course, usually the simulation happens and you draw certain transport engineering and uh, mobility answers out of it. But in a sense, what you get is a data set of agents, you know, synthetic people moving about. And so there's an enormous amount of data in it, which you can query. And so you can check certain things in relation to certain plots, trip duration, related to different modes, things like that. Again, you need an ontology. This one's an existing one to map all these things together. You see again that you have a explosion of a data size because you're doing it in a semantic way. Um, but rather than just getting the kind of analysis from a transport planner, you can query what you want. So it opens up this information. Finally, the third demonstrator is a future scenarios builder. That's uh, very tentative in that sense. So that's planned and there are a couple of things working on, but we're looking at the third point here of advantages. So exploring, creating and uh, learning. Um, so what I mentioned, scenarios, uh, reasoning and, and finding out new knowledge and looking into how a system of agents can learn and, and self-organize. So especially scenarios, hence the name, are interesting here. There's some work done uh, at Cambridge Cares already for scenarios on um, electricity generation and carbon emissions. Um, so there is already a framework to do what they call parallel world scenarios. But of course, the application is not city planning. Um, and we're also, for example, currently um, working on analyzing our knowledge representation. So we have a zoning ontology. What are its properties? What are the properties of this graph? What can we learn from that? Um, how is it represented? Is there some kind of metric of our knowledge that we could learn from? That was an overview of what we're doing in Cities Knowledge Graph. Um, I'll conclude now to look beyond the project towards shared representations and linked data. So to recap the main points, um, I, I mentioned that knowledge representation as such is domain agnostic. You can do it anywhere. And it's useful for machines, for humans, and to work together. Interoperability is very important for this synthesis, incrementality, and diversity. And particularly, it's a paradigm. And you can apply the technology to anything, not just to city planning. That's just cities knowledge graphs focus. And cities knowledge graph is also, as a case in point, part of an agglomeration of knowledge graph projects under the banner of the world avatar. That's why you see that name referred in certain links. So if you check out uh, this page, you see different projects from a variety of uh, topics. There's chemistry chatbots, there's uh, virtual sensors and pollution, there's digital twins, there's the scenarios as mentioned, and they're all building representations that are compatible. And of course, the end goal, although we're far away, is a representation of the whole world because that's the only stopping point. And in this way, we're 
going towards bridging human artificial intelligence to support synthesis in future cities. We are the Cities Knowledge Graph project, and I'm Peter Hettors. Um, does anyone have any questions? I can pass the mic around. Hi, I'm Sarad. Um, so regarding the slide, which had the query, who is the father of the wife of the king of Bhutan? The search result seems to be the one for the wife, not for the father, if I'm not mistaken on your slide. It could be. You want me to go back? I, th I think it's, I've made that assumption at some point too, but I, then I checked it and I thought it was correct. But I'm not acquainted with them, so <laughs> can't be sure. I'm, uh, I'm just wondering why that's all. Oh, wow. Yeah. These, these queries often also make mistakes. I've tried out, of course, many making, finding a good example, and it doesn't always work. So, of course, I'm showing the example that works. Uh, uh, maybe I'll go to a screen that looks better. So I won't go all the way there. So I think I thought I checked it. I thought it was correct, but could be that it's not. And yeah, many of these queries are wrong, which is also, you know, um, there are often mistakes in these systems, so particularly when you're using voice assistants, you'll know that they're often really silly, but they're continuously getting better. So in that sense, there's a limit to what is already represented for your everyday questions, but the same is true for doing city planning where it's a very narrow application that we're doing, you know, or look. so in that sense, there's many more topics that you could integrate, but each integration requires an auto representation step. Um, and that's kind of the barrier to entry. So everything can be included, but it takes effort to include it. Any other questions? So when you, when you do the onto zoning or the onto buildable space, and then you do it for Singapore, and now when you start doing this for Berlin, is it like a completely new project or do you build upon it? And then, or most of it is so fundamental that it's reusable? Uh, no, unfortunately not. So that's the interesting thing about human systems and humans ability to conceptualize abstract things automatically. We are pattern recognizers. And unfortunately also wrong pattern recognizers. That's our downside. Um, but so, Everybody understands that land use is a central thing and it has concepts that are replicated everywhere, but there's actually no general land use representation. Often there's not even a representation for a particular locale. There might be for some, but so in that sense, you can't transpose one city's regulations to another's. It's going to be different, but as we build more and more of these regulations, we'll be able to formulate a proposal for a general land use uh, representation. And there are, of course, common things that, that return. And, and so you have onto zoning, which is, you know, you have onto zoning Singapore in that sense. And above that is a general onto zoning and you could have onto zoning Berlin and they'd have different values and settings and maybe even relationships. Um, but so in that sense, there is no general land use representation. It's, it's, it's something that, yeah, everybody understands that the concepts are the same and that they might be, but everybody applies them differently, et cetera. Um, that doesn't mean there, it doesn't exist, a kind of hidden formal structure, but we, we don't know it. We haven't represented it. Something like a city GML or a city engine, which have some ontological logic behind mm -hmm. it and then can represent a lot. Not a Yes, but that is, so that can't represent everything. It's improving with each version. It also, it, it's, especially the older versions, they're modeled from a visualization point of view, also a, a geographic point of view. Like for example, the, the concept of space only comes in in version three. And from a planner point of view, space is very important. And so in that sense, it, it depends on who's developing. and each application might have different representations. So that's, and that's not a problem. 
the thing is you need to have in place, let's say ontologies of ontologies that can link these. Um, and so in that sense, I'm preaching uh, a kind of work together, open standards, et cetera, but there's also lots of work that actually doesn't follow these standards, et cetera, et cetera and that ontologies that are difficult to combine and that are made simply to make an application quickly. And, and so it's as per usual, but that we're building towards uh, a more central thing. But in that sense, humans use a lot of systems that are not explicitly understood. We just use them and we learn them through practice. That doesn't mean there isn't a formalization that we could find, but we're not aware of this system. And that's important because actually, if we would find these systems, we could actually use them and that it's easier to use a formal system than an implicit one. So we have four questions online. Okay. Um, so the first question is from Aurel, who says, um, who asks, how does this work align with the Singaporean Urban Redevelopment Authority's aims to digital, digitalize urban planning? Was that Aurel's question? Or? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you, Aurel. Um, so, so the um, this is actually on the radar of the URA. They are they are very interested in um ontology specifically to have this kind of technology that can act as an assistant to planners um that's part of the the ura's vision and, and documentation um it takes a kind of more uh, an assistant narrative but it's the same kind of technology in that sense um because of course it's it, it's i think because you know i'm that i can only speak out of my own interpretation but i think that that's also because there's so much that can contribute in terms of tools, et cetera, but you need help in processing all these things. There's so many evaluations that you can do goals to go for, whether it's you know less heat, less energy, more, more wildlife, et cetera, but these things can conflict. And so you need support to keep track of, of, of all these things, whether that's what evaluation was made or which decision you took five days ago all of these something you know an assistant can support with um, um so we have some questions from Wei Ming uh, from ntu singapore uh so the first question is do you materialize all data from multiple sources to rdf or do you integrate data on the fly namely a virtual kg approach maybe i can go through the second and third question as well uh, it's better because okay. I, I don't remember. Okay. I need I need an assistant to remember the questions. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the the data is transformed and stored. Um, so in that sense, it isn't done on the fly. Um, it okay. might differ for certain applications, etc. But in general, that's that's the case. Um, the so the second knowledge. question is: uh, Do ontological and rule based reasoning enable? Uh, are okay so are ontological and rule based reasoning enabled in your kg knowledge graph um so that depends we're not we're only exploring the reasoning right now um in terms of rule based um uh, let's say planning and design that's something that we won't explore that'll be that'll happen in our semantic urban elements uh, project more because that focuses on urban design in terms of the idea of, of rule-based planning and rule-based design. Um, so in that sense, um, yeah, currently we're only going into the reasoning and it'll stick to a kind of legislatory reasoning uh, point of view. Uh, the last question from Weiming is, uh, do you think machine learning, especially knowledge representation learning, can be used for data mining from your knowledge graph? Um, by data mining, does that imply finding new knowledge? Or because of course, if it's, if it's data mining in, the, in what I interpret as the conventional interpretation, the data has already been put on the knowledge graph. Um, so is it, is it finding new knowledge or is it, automatically using a knowledge graph to do data mining. We're not doing that, but of course, all the big tech companies are certainly doing that, so it's possible. 
Um, but that's for us. Uh, this particularly cities knowledge graph is less, let's say, dynamic in terms of big data flows and things like that because city planning has a very large time scale uh, in terms of horizon. It, in that sense, you're looking at you know a master plan has a five year update cycle. That's not something you need a kind of data stream for in order to do. So that that aspect is less uh, our interest, but it's being done in different projects under our world avatar banner. Okay, we have one more question from Steven. Um, so Steven says the potentials are quite profound. The what and where query combinations can allow government and private sector city making actors to make mixed use experiments. What are the possible user scenarios, including communities and improving participatory planning? Thank you, Stephen. That's a good question. Um, so it is true that um, mixed use is an interesting exploration because that's also the examples. Um, and we've even done studies on defining mixed use archetypes in Singapore with Google Maps data and then representing those as an extension of the ontozoning ontology. I didn't cover that uh, today. Um, in that sense, I think it would be interesting to analyze let's say the solution space or the potential space of certain regulations, because then if you're saying, oh, I want to do urban farming, that's a combination of residents and agriculture, where is that currently allowed? Is that allowed in you know, my local politician's jurisdiction? <laughs> if you have data, then maybe you can share that and things like that. And that, that, that's just one example of a mix, uh, but you could do any mix and you could see what is possible if this is what we want to do, where can we do it? As a, as a, let's say, individual or group, you can find the spaces that you can do it or maybe propose things that can almost do it. As a government regulator, you can change the regulations, but then you can analyze what is possible in order to better support you know, your next visions, et cetera. So it becomes possible to measure this potential space of your future city, which is interesting. We haven't done it yet because we don't fully have it yet. But that is very that would be very interesting to do data analytics on on the potential future city and a measurable version rather than just a vision that is qualitative. I have a couple more questions online. If anyone here wants to ask first, no, okay. Uh, so Daniel asks, um, what is the potential for this to be an open-ended platform where crowdsourced libraries or branches like GitHub, Python? can further enrich and provide a diversity of solutions and incorporate further current knowledge? Um, all our code that is finished, we share publicly on GitHub. Actually, us supporting the platform uh, it depends on us having a mandate and a budget to do so. So that's a different question. But uh, in the spirit of uh, linked open data and open knowledge representation, everything that is at ready enough we, is publicly available. Okay, so we have one last question from Javier. Um, it seems that currently the ontologies are very consistent and uniformly curated. Have you tested to deal with more asymmetrical or unequal data definitions across elements, plots, and incomplete knowledge in quotes? That's a good question. Thank you, Javier. Um, I, I think this could be an artifact of how I present it, because <laughs> you try to present a very complete picture. But in that sense, um, there's a lot of unknowns uh, in, in the background. Um, of course, when, and we're also selecting for, let's say, full coverage data sets. Uh, or at least for what we're presenting here. So there's a selection bias, I think. That doesn't, and so in that sense, I'm sure we have worked with less than good coverage data sets, et cetera, but I can't really re recall any particular anecdotes to give a further answer uh, to that question. Yeah, I think that's it with the question. Okay. Thanks everybody here for joining. Thanks everybody online 
for joining and uh, see you at the next seminar. Thanks, Peter.